Hello and welcome to the 2020 series sponsored by the New York Film Academy. The 2020 series are creative conversations with visionaries about craft, creativity, and collaboration. I'm Liz Hinline, creative director and filmmaker. Um, we, Pablo and I are gonna have 20 minutes of shop talk and, and talking about all things film. And then we'll have 20 minutes of answering questions from you, the global audience. Feel free to write into the Q&A. We would love to get to all your questions, see what you know we can share with you. And without further ado, let me introduce amazing, visionary, prolific filmmaker, Pablo Berger. Hello, Pablo. Hi, Liz, how are you? I like I, that visionary, but I think that's too much, too much. But I'm a, I'm a film director, a filmmaker. I like that word, I'm a filmmaker. Filmmaker. It's funny, audience, we were just in the middle of a conversation Pablo lived for nine years in New York, and then he also, you know, moved to Spain. Has been uh, prolific in Spain as a major A-list director there. And there is something about talk to me. You know, it feels like Europe, especially in the last four years, has respected culture and always has respected culture and put money into culture, money into filmmaking. And have you? Did you move to Spain because you thought it would be easier to raise money for films? No, I, I, I've never done the, the right things. I've always done the wrong things, but somehow they became the right things. I, I moved to Spain because I had a script that took place in Spain. I, I, I didn't escape from New York. We know what New Yorkers, I feel a New Yorker at heart. So I, I passed the first five years at this uh, trial, but after five years, I feel a New Yorker. I had a, a good life. I wrote a script that took place in, in Spain. So the only way that I, we could make it happen and my wife is my closest collaborator. We moved to Spain and, and we, we tried to make it there and, and we actually, we did. Torremolino 73, that's our first film. And when, when you first moved there, how did you break, break into the Spanish industry? Did you have film collaborators already there or how well, that worked? That, that, that was hard. The thing is that I, I was just a, NYU graduate with my MFA and I, I, I arrived to Spain thinking that I was just going to show the title and all the doors were going to open and and it was quite the contrary. It was very, very hard to get my, my first film off the ground. Actually, it was a pretty big, big budget film. It was a period film. So I it took me many, many years and, and, and it put me in my place. You know, when you just graduate out of NYU or like a, what you would say like a prestigious film school you think you're a big shot and in reality you're not you're just a, like a beginner an apprentice and and sometimes you have to learn the hard way so it was a, it was a long way until I, I got the finance and what you know what you were mentioning before which I thought was amazing is and this is the, the jobs of the filmmaker you're not only the visionary director but it is the knowing about the money raise, how do you raise money and knowing about the distribution and how you how to get it out there besides showing it to your mom and your friends. So what now, knowing what you know now, what would you have done differently in the financing and in the distribution for your first film? Well, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm like, I'm kind of the positive type. I think things happen for a reason. I, I, it took me many, many years, but but as I as I talked to you before, we got start the broadcast. It's just what I learned in NYU that you have to be a filmmaker, and I, when I and I when I mean the word filmmaker, you write, you direct, you produce, you make it happen. So when I came to Spain, I was also oh well, no, I appear as producer in my film. So one of the first things that I learned in NYU is that you have to read Variety, you have to you have to check the trade papers, you have to network. And that's what I did. And actually that part of being writer, director, producer, that was key in, in, in the process of my career. I'm a producer in all my films because I, as a director, you also have to be involved in that process. So you don't, you don't lose kind of like the, the paternity of the project and, and you're part of the, 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 the way of how the films are getting made. No? Well, do you find like, you know, the director has only so much say so, but the producer has more of the say so, like for casting, let's say, or something like that? Well, the, the thing is that one of, one of the reasons, you know, I, I'm happy working in the European film industry that somehow 
directors, we have like the, I wouldn't say the last call, but we have kind of, in my case, I have, I have a director's cut and, I, and, I, and I've been lucky enough that I found producers that like my work, they respected me and they, they let me like do the right cast and, and put my crew together. Definitely the producer has a lot of to say To I think it's like a, it's like a marriage. It's like a, as husband and wife, you know, you, you have a dialogue and definitely I have a, I have a very good relation with all my producers. I had like two producers, mainly my last producer, I have worked with three films. So that's a very long marriage. And, mm. and they, as long as they like the script, basically what the way I, I, I work with them is just, I write a script and if they fell in love, if they fall in love with my project, they just go forward and they just fight for it. But, and in that process, yeah, we collaborate. They like, they like certain things, they don't like certain things, but once the script is green lighted, you know, they, I, I talk with them about the cast. I talk about, about the crew, but they always give, let me the, the last word, which I know is, is very, normally is very different in the, once I think in the studio system in, in America. So in that sense, I, I feel lucky to be working in, you know, it's, it's a smaller films. Definitely we, we work in a different budget from the big studio American, uh, American film, but yeah, but it's, it's, it's a different industry, definitely. And when you are writing, how do you know, is A, is writing easy for you? And how do you know that you're done? <laughs> You're never done. You never, you never finish a script. You just let it go. You abandon. It's like you abandon the script because actually, as you know, you're a director yourself. You know that every every step of the way you're writing. You know, you write the script. When you're shooting, you're writing a new script. When you're editing, you're edit a new script. And even in the mix, you are. I remember like doing creative decisions. So. The, the scripts are abandoned and and I think imperfection is perfection you know you always they never finish the film you know they always have you know things that every time I watch one of my films even if they had like good reviews or they they were like well received I see the problems but they're like your children you know the, of course they have problems they're, we are not perfect but but you know but we love our film the fact that I I write direct and produce I feel that all my films are very dear for me, even if I know what are the, their problems. Does your cultural background affect your choices in the types of films you make? Well, completely, definitely. I think uh, all that we leave is just kind of like what, what comes back in when we become filmmakers. I even think that those early years are a great influence when you're like a teenager, when you're 12, when you're 15, even like I think like even my previous years I, before film school, if I went to NYU when I was 25 to do the master's degree, I think up to 20, they were like, I think key, key years in my, more in the terms of storytelling, the stories that I want to tell. Definitely when I went to film school, I learned a craft and I learned so many things in film school. It was one of the best moments of my life. But I think when I have to go to storytelling or what makes, my films unique or different from others, I think comes from my, my background. Is there a through line that you, or is there a through line or is like a question that you're constantly looking for? The, like what sort of, I guess, inspires you to, okay, this is the project because I want, there's something in, in me that needs to come out through this vehicle called a film. Well, I think, I think there are many things, but definitely I, I feel I'm a, I'm a visual filmmaker. You know, I, I really, I, believe, I like to write with images. So there has to be something in the form of the film that is just, is like, turns me on. I say, I want to make a film this way. You know, even if, if you see all my films, they are visually very different from them. There's something about each, each them that is attract me. And definitely I, I have only one goal. You know, I think like, uh, surprise the audience. I want to surprise the audience. I, I like cinema as it's like a, a circus. I like to be like a, a magician. I, I like to go to the old days of Melier where the director, they like to surprise the audience. So if I feel that the film is something unique and that the audience is going to go for a roller coaster ride, I say, oh, that's the project that I want to make, you know? And that's kind of like 
that's kind of like what has been moving me through every project that I've, I've made up to now and, and what is going to be my next project as well. Interesting. Interesting. Well, that's a good segue. So, Charlie, let's play this great trailer from um, one of uh, Pablo's films, Abracadabra. Look at that. Magically, it happens. I like it. Os quiero pedir, por favor, que miréis atentamente mis manos en mis sueños. Uno, dos, duerme. Oh, that's so great. That's so great. So talk to me about your casting because you have such wonderful faces and such a, they're expressive and interesting and and how do you have like a theory or methodology with your casting? Well, I, I one of my favorite filmmakers is Fellini. So definitely the faces are key. Uh, actually, Abracadabra is, is my last film. And the main actors are like big Spanish stars. You know, like Maribel Verdú, the, the lead woman. She, she was in Y tu mamá también, de Alfonso Cuarón, or Tetro de Coppola, uh, Belle Epoque. She's really, and she even was in my previous film, Blanca Nieves. She's a Maribel Verdú, a fantastic actress. Antonio de la Torre, the, the male, the lead male, is one of the biggest actors. So definitely, the fact that it's, it's a, it was a big film, a big budget film for Spanish standards, it needed a big cast and they're, they're also great actors, but also they have great faces too. Mm -hmm. So I, I think casting is one of my favorite parts of the process as well. And I, and I like the idea that the casting is like, I feel like I'm like a wedding photographer and I put all the cast together and I just take a photo. So I, I have to feel that it's balanced, that the protagonists and the supporting roles that they're a little behind and even the extras, I think everybody that appears in a film, they have to have something that, that makes it unique and interesting. And it just, that I, I don't believe it, it cannot be any false note. So that, that group photo has to be kind of like unique for me at least. And do you, when you're in the casting, do you like, do you do private meetings? Do you do like, do you put little scenes together? Like how, how do you sort of, what's your cooking method? Well, the, the thing is sometimes for the lead roles, uh, the, they're just big stars and you mm -hmm. know their work and they have many films. So you just offer them the role. But for, for supporting roles, or sometimes when you're unsure, even if there's a big role or they're famous actors, you, you, you make an audition. And, and what I like to do is improvisation, improvisation. I really love to work with actors that they're you know, a little animals in the sense that they just let themselves go, that you put them in a, in a sometimes uncomfortable situation or a unique situation and just let's see how they ad lib. Let's see what do they do. I think I like the idea that the, the actor gives me something. I don't like the idea that the director just is a control freak that reenacts 
that is expecting that the actor does what he's doing. You know, I, I like them that they, that they love the material, that they feel comfortable and that they can offer. I'm, I'm waiting the actor to give me things. Mm. So what type of director are you on set, would you say? Well, it's, it's difficult to know, you know, because I, I will tell you what people say. You know, I, some, they say that I, I'm calm. That's what they say, that I, I rarely, that I'm not the screamy type, that I see like I'm like, I don't know, inside I feel like there's like a, my stomach feels like a washing machine or a dryer, really. Like I'm, I'm always, I feel I'm always tense. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm improving. You know, the thing is that every film, I'm, I feel like, I feel more comfortable on the set. I remember my first film, I was a nervous wreck. I was... I was suffering. I, I struggled so much with my first shooting. Also, because I, I was, I had an idea what a director was supposed to, to be. I, I, th I thought, even if I had gone to film school, uh, I, I, it was, it was very theoretical in a way too. A film school, even if you go to, you know, that you make many short films, you have an idea what a director is, and, and maybe I thought a director had to be like almost like Eric von Stroheim that had to have a vision and every, everybody should do what he thinks. And if, and if people get away from that idea, it's just, you get nervous. So I suffer because of that. And I realized that you have to be more relaxed. You have to go with the flow. You have to dance, you have to listen. And every film, I think that I'm listening, I'm a better listener. And I, and I think that if there's a definition for a director, I think is directing is listening. And I think you have to, you have a crew, you have a, people that want to help you and and the, the the treasure map is the script so as long as the I'm the writer director so I have the treasure map right. and I have a direction to go and I just have to I have to get the help from a lot of people to make, get the film done you know and do you like when you're coming on to set do you have your like what are you carrying do you have nothing do you have your storyboards do you have your like script like what are you that day of work, what are you carrying with you? Yeah, no, I'm I'm a storyboard type. I, I I storyboard my films. You know, for me, Hitchcock is one of those great directors that he had everything storyboarded, and I like to have everything storyboarded. So I, before I get on the set, I've done my homework and I spend with my storyboard artists like six months, nine months, just doing the storyboards. So I always have the storyboard in one hand. I always have the script on the other. So it's just it's just like I have to have them all the time. Mm -hmm. And and definitely I'm I'm addicted to coffee. So the moment I get on the set, I go to the <laughs> table, I get my coffee, and I go straight to the makeup to say hello to the actors. You know that's key. That moment, I have to. I, it's a very nice moment, cozy moment to say hello, good morning, how are you, and just a little chit chat. And and you know I think that's that's a, a great moment. And then of course your right hand is the is the DP, you know. At the same time, the assistant director is by by you all the time, you know. And you know, it's it's exciting. Definitely it's a it's a very exciting. You have to be like alert. You know, it's kind of like you're it's a different, I think there are two Pablos or many Pablos, I think. But when you're on a set, you have to put like some extra battery energy and you have to be anything can happen any moment and you have to be very you know aware of everything you know uh, but I'm 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 a suffering type director you know I, I my favorite part is the writing I love writing I love pre-production I love post-production I love to go to festivals and selling the film but the shooting is something you have to go through <laughs> Fortunately, every time I, I go through a little better, but it's, it's hell. You know, who wants to wake up at five o'clock in the morning and just having troubles all the time, you know, but, but it, that's the only way to make movies. So I, I just have to, it's like, a, it's like giving birth. You cannot give birth without pain. So at the end, making movies for a director is like, is like a giving birth. And when you're on set, are you, where are you? Are you in your video village? Are you next to the camera? Are you, where are you placing yourself? I'm old school, old school. I'm next to the camera. You know, that's, that's when I went to film school, we didn't have video taps. Mm -hmm. And 
I need to feel, I, I work all my films with the same director of photography, Kiko de la Rica. He's one of the greatest of Spanish directors, director of photography. And I, I don't like to be by the monitor. It has to be very difficult crane movement, very sophisticated that I wanted to get it perfect. But in general, I like, I like to be next to the camera and I like to feel the acting. I don't like to see the acting through the monitor. I, I want the actors to feel that I'm like three feet away, four feet away. And I just, I want to, if I want to give a little direction, I want to go quickly. And, and definitely that's one of my favorite moments. Let's put it this way. I, this whole madness of the shooting, sometimes it drives me crazy, but the moment I say action and the scene is happening and we are all concentrated and the sound of the camera when you're shooting on film, <laughs> It's just magic. That moment is that time stops and everybody's concentrated on what's happening in front of the lens. That's my favorite moment. And then you say, cut. And then hell starts again. That's great. Yeah, I mean, that is, that is that thrill. And it's also that flow, the flow state. Yeah, that moment, I, I think one of, that's why I would say that's one of the reasons I make films. I remember my first short film on Super 8. The first time I did my first, shot, I, I heard that action, I said action. It just, that it was a magical moment when you're shooting a scene. And do you work with the same editor consistently? I, my first film was one editor, but then it, I had a great experience. He was Rory Sainz de Rozas, but she retired. She was, a, she was pretty old already. And then my, my second film, Fernando Franco, he did Blanca Nieves. He's a great editor, but he's also a director. So on my next film, my third film, I, he was working on his own film. So I worked with a new, another great, I always had great editors and had a great time because I love post-production. But now on my new film, I'm going back to Fernando Franco. I'm repeating now with, mm -hmm. so I have now two great editors that, but I have to tell to my last editor, I have to, I want to work with this one, but the next one. So it's good, it's good exactly. to have, it's good to have a couple of editors or DPs that you like and, and they understand that some projects maybe are better for one or maybe they're busy or. And, um, and what do you love about Post so much? I love everything, everything. It's just after this hell of a shoot that you are like, tracks and people and walkie talkies and extras and if you go you don't sleep yeah the project sometimes goes the wrong way and then you're not sleeping well and then finish and you just meet in the editing room and you have the coffee mug and you're with the editor that is very nice and and you spend months and months and then you start with the sound design or the visual effects and then you were the composer and you go to the mix with two because basically they're steps that they're with a small with a very with two or three people mm -hmm. and, and you have a different pace mm -hmm. so it's very like and it's just coming to life you're really like tweaking and you and you see how it's almost like a like a sculpture that in the editing room you are starting to give a shape and then when you get to the final when you're color correcting and the mixing is just like wow it's finishing and you just know it's I love that part of the post-production. It's very, and I love to work with the composer. I think that's also one of my favorite parts of the process. We have a bunch of questions here, Pablo. So I'm gonna just okay. check them out and I will, um, okay. Hussein asks, do I need to know the whole story of my film before shooting it? How may I plan the craft without knowing the whole story? Well, the, the thing is that the first rule of, of filmmaking is there's no rules. Okay, so for me, I, I need to have a very tight script. I'm, I'm very old school about a script. I th really think the script is that, as I said before, the treasure map. So I have, to, I have to feel the script is working. So I have the film in peace. And definitely a film should be like, a, it should be like, the third act should be like a big explosion. So you really need to construct in such a way that the third act it, it, is amazing climax. So you really need to have the end. So, so I, even when you write a script, it's good that you have in the structure, even you don't have the detailed script, you haven't started writing, it's very good to know where you're going. 
how you're getting there, you, I'm sure you're going to make many stops. But for me, in my case, it helps me a lot to know the, the end of the, of the script. Um, and do you, and, and in your writing, Nathan, do you do you do the whole beats of the script or do you do note cards or do you, how do you, how do you approach <laughs> your writing? Yes, uh, the thing is that I went to film school. You know, I'm, I did a graduate program, so it's many years. It's like three years of classes and I have all the books, Sid Field, McKee, Linda Sega, whatever, every year there's a new book. So I read them all. But from the moment I start writing my own feature scripts, I put, I have it behind, but I never look at them and I just let myself go. You have to, for, yeah, I think you, it's good to, to read all the manuals and have some kind of know the basic rules. But then when you get to writing, at least in my case, I like to I like to be very chaotic. I like to write almost a automatic ray, way. I, I almost feel like my computer is almost like a, the glass of a Ouija, and I'm going like almost possessed. And I write words and images and ideas, and then I put a structure. Mm. So I think you have to start in chaos to open your mind. I don't think you have to put limits, and then you put some order. And for me, the order is the is the the tales. Like storytelling for me is the, the tale, the fables. So I always put like a little little story and, and, I, and I try to make, well, let's say crazy eccentric stories on the surface, but a very straightforward story that doesn't exclude the, the audience, you know, that people can follow. There's a protagonist, there's a antagonist, there's objectives, there are obstacles, you know, basic rules there are four rules that you have to follow but at the end the only rule for me as i said before is just to surprise the audience and i and i and i think that's what makes every writer director or every writer different from the others what which way do you surprise the audience it's interesting it's very interesting i what don't i don't go with the beats or i don't analyze in this page i need this or this rule i don't i don't get so analytical about it right Right, it's more freeform, but the, but it still is sort of classic storytelling. But having the circus of the Fellini circus, completely, it's almost I, like the 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 magical fairy dust that happens, and then you go through the fairy dust, and you're like, oh, okay, here's the emotional story. You got it. You know, at least I I believe in that. I I you know, there's many genres in cinema, many directors, there are kind of films, but in my case, I I I believe. The magical moment that I really want. I like the idea. Even my previous film, Abracadabra, is about hypnotism. The the background, you know. I I really feel like as a director, you have to hypnotize the audience. So that idea of just like getting the audience into this two D screen and just get them inside. So that's that's my goal. And you talked a bunch about film school and stuff like that. And I know you know you've been a successful. Professor, what can be taught? What of filmmaking can be taught in your, and what can't be taught? Well, I, you know, I really think you, the basics can be taught, definitely, you know, and and there's a famous story, or at least I don't know if it's an urban legend, but that Orson Welles, before he made Citizen Kane, he just watched over and over and over the stagecoach of John Ford to learn the basics. And then he made what we is considered one of the best films of all time. So definitely, I think the basic rules, I think they can be, they can be taught. And definitely in film school is a, the place to try things. And because films, you don't make it by yourself, you need a crew. So it's a great place to meet editors and cinematographers and, and work in many films. I think it's a, it's a great place. But you know, sometimes you can go to film school and you don't go to film school. But but what you what you need is just like passion and and basically you just want to the need to tell stories. And I, and I think the great thing about a film school there's equipment, there's sound stages, and and definitely there are people that they that that you're one of us. You feel people that they're like they they have the same goal as you do, and that really it really helps. You know, I think you know that kind of like all say that uh, alone you you go you go faster but but together you you get further so i think i, I think it's nice to be in a in a film school i like the idea for me it was a great experience to go to film school and did you um 
did one day a light bulb go off and I said, I must go to film school and it must be NYU or was there sort of a, a journey to that? It was a process, but definitely I, you know, I'm talking about long time ago, okay? When I, when, when it was, when I was 18, there was no film schools. Like, you know, I, I was born in the early sixties in Spain. So at that time there was no film school in Spain. My film school was to go to the San Sebastian Film Festival mm -hmm. and a great film festival. So I used to go every year for eight days and watch as many films as I could. And at that time, like around the early 80s that I, I used to go, the, in the catalog, there were many filmmakers from New York, like Jim Jarmus, mm -hmm. like Oliver Stone, like Susan Sederman, like Spike Lee. And they all came, graduated from NYU Film School, MFA, NYU. And I said, okay, so at that time we had to write letters. And three after I wrote a letter to NYU, I, like three weeks later, I received this vanilla envelope and with a big catalog. And then you see, oh, MFA. And I was so excited and I read it three years and directing, writing, cinematography. And then you get to the last page and you see a like tuition fees. Oh my God, I got crazy tuition fees. I couldn't believe the price of education in, in a great American university. So that, that was it. I said, my dream was over, but then I said, okay, I have to, I have to do something. So I made, I kept buying books. I made my first short film. My first short film was a success in, in this festival circuit in Europe. And then I applied a scholarship in mm -hmm. Spanish from the Basque government and I got a scholarship. And at the same time, I got accepted to NYU. So everything was kind of like, basically it was a long way. It was kind of like, it was like a master plan that I, I, I got it, it made it happen. But it was like, it was like, a, you know, I think if you would tell me what one recommendation I would tell to a director or filmmaker is just patient, you know, patient and just life is not a straight line. It's just full of curves. And, and sometimes you have to have a little break. And, you know, at least in my case, it's been that way. And, and it was definitely, it was a long way to go to, to NYU film school, but I will never forget that day of say, I got to NYU, I got accepted, which you know how difficult it is to get to this prestigious film school. I got accepted, I'm in New York. It was like, it was like 1990. This is all before, as we know, the internet and the globalization. It was when New York was like raw, very raw. That's cool. You must have a lot of really good stories about New York. Yeah, yeah. You had the CBGB, you had the East Village when it was really happening. It was like when the Times Square was, it was not the Times Square as we see it now. It was like not the taxi driver at Times Square, but it was a Times Square, which which it was kind of shitty at the time still. Totally, totally. It was when, it was when the... Uh, the West Village was, you know, with real meatpacking was really meatpacking district. It was really, yeah. Well, I, my first, my first short film was was working in the meatpacking. It was shot in the meatpacking district. Yeah, the meat, <laughs> it's amazing how much New York has changed since it was 1990 when I, it was 1990 when I, I arrived to New York. Right now, there's a lot of Disneyland that's happened to New York. <laughs> how do you keep? You know, we've talked a, a, a bunch about like you know the you just said patience and perseverance and the, the, you know, the time it takes to raise the money for the film. How do you keep your sense of humor and how do you keep going with a project and not um, second, I don't know, question yourself? I, I think it's hard. Definitely it's hard. I'm, I'm lucky that I have a partner that is my wife and every project we, we work, we decide together, you know, which, which project are we going to spend five years of our life, three, eight years. So definitely it helps to have a partner, you know? But at the same time, what it's key is that every project that you choose to move forward, to, to make it happen, you have to love it. You have to think it's amazing. You, you know, I really, I really think that just, you cannot make films just because you think the audience is gonna like it or you think it's trendy or, be, or because you, 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 you're selling your soul to the, to the producers. I, I don't know, that's not, oh no, I think anybody can do anything. But in my case, it's been that every project that I wanted to make, it was, it was a love child. It was completely a love child that you really wanted to make it, you know? 
That's why I'm a writer, director, producer. But you know, it's just, but every, every director, writer, director has a different story. It just, I just cannot make films that I don't believe that, that, that is worth to be fighting for five years. For example, my, my previous film to Abracadabra, Blanca Nieves, it took me eight years to make it happen. And so it was, you know, and through many of those years I was working, I was directing film programs for NYFA in Paris and in UK. So I just, I was still doing other things. So I was writing project, other projects, but I had to be for eight years, like trying to make it happen. And, and it happened at the end, you know? That is amazing. And it is, it really is the long game, as yes. I say, you know, it really is the long game. Um, where are you getting your inspiration from now? Well, I, I think curiosity is key for a writer director. So I'm always reading the news, uh, Googling on the internet or going to expositions, watching films from all over the world, listening to new music, uh, looking, looking through magazines, you know, anywhere or talking with a friend, for example, when I, when I meet with people that I don't know, I, instead of talking about my career, talking about films, I'm always more curious about what do you do for a living or what is your, or when they, they have a profession that I don't know anything, just ask them questions about their profession. Many things, photo books, I don't know. Any, any, but normally, definitely for every script, in general, there's always an image, sometimes a photo. You know, for example, for, for Blanca Nieves, definitely was a, it was a photo of like bullfighters. There was a photo of a very famous photographer. It was a bullfighter's midgets looking straight to camera. And the, the, it's Cristina Garcia Rodero, one of the biggest photographers in Spain. She works for Magnum. And that photo is just, that's the poster of a film. I said that there's a film there in those midgets that they're like, that they're like bullfighters. So it's just like, why if, what if I put a young woman dressed as a bullfighter and she's in charge and that became like, a, you know, mm -hmm. Spanish Snow White, you know, and, and, and the film takes place in the 20s and it's silent. And then one thing brought me to another, you know. That's really amazing. Uh, we have well, time for like a final question. So we're going to do it quickly. Um, for upcoming filmmakers, this is, I'm sure you get this all the time. This is from Jess. For upcoming fil filmmakers, what would be your best advice? How do you find your voice? Wow. I, th I think you really have to kind of like be yourself and just, just make films about the things that you're interested in. You know, if you don't, I think the worst thing that could happen to a filmmaker that goes to a film school and get domesticated, you know, and I've seen it many times. I really, you have to go with, with something that, that is inside of you. I think, and, and never forget your intuition. I think directors, what we are, we're intuition. We are like a polygraph. We are machines that we have to feel things so i think you have to you have to feel it if you don't feel it don't do it mm. don't we are animals don't so i don't don't get too analytical sometimes we get too analytical you know i, I one of my best friends he's big gigantic executive in a gigantic corporation and, and he told me once the the most important decisions they are made like this in one second you can go around forever, for weeks, for months. So for me as a director, when I make a casting decision, boom. When I decide which script I think is better, my heart tells me it's just almost like here. So just, just listen, to, listen to yourself, you know, really. And you'll find the, the right project that you want to make. That's amazing. Oh, this has been so fun. Um, I am sorry, but we are out of time. Okay. I'm so, it was thrill, thrilled to meet you. And, and I know you're not on social media, so people can rent your films on Amazon. Okay. Yes. Right. Anywhere else we could, should look for your. Well, I think I would just to finish, I just want to tell you my last film is going to take place in New York. It's called Robot Dreams. Let's do a little promotion. It's called, Ro I'm working on it. It's called Robot Dreams. 
It's an animation film based on a graphic novel from Sarah Baron, and we are in pre-production. So my next crazy film is an animation film 2D, and I'm very, very excited about it. Well, that sounds fantastic. How exciting. So thank you so much, Pablo, and thank you, New York Film Academy, for hosting the 2020 series. Um, it's been wonderful. I've learned so much. And um, be safe and happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Bye. Bye. It was a pleasure.